you're listening to the dental guys full arch digital implant prosthetic scan an interview with mark ludlow this week on the dental guys we bring our favorite scanner researcher dr mark ludlow back on the show and he has recently joined the university of utah to continue his research and expanding what's possible with the latest and greatest in intraoral scanning technology. We discuss this groundbreaking new revelation in the ability to scan accurately with trueness and high fidelity for full arch implant prosthetics. Yes, the first truly validated workflow in a intraoral scanner for implant prosthetics. We've got it here this week on The Dental Guys. When The Dental Guys need an infection prevention product, we turn to Kerr and their Total Care line. Kerr has been an industry leader in infection control and prevention products for years. And when we think of infection control, cavicide and cavi wipes are the first things that come to our minds. It's automatic and there's a reason for that. Kerr knows dentistry and their products work. The Dental Guys trust Kerr products in our offices, and you should too. Stay safe with Kerr Total Care. Looking for a lab that understands the bridge between art and science? Check out the Dental Crafters Network. Dental Crafters, one relationship, infinite possibilities. Contact them at 1-800-472-8302 or at dentalcrafters.net. Do you want to learn to predictably place and restore dental implants using the most modern science and technology? We are talking 60 hours of CE in a comprehensive curriculum and live surgical implant placement on pre-selected patients. Head over to RestorativeDrivenImplants.com to learn more today. Well, welcome to this week's episode of The Dental Guys. I'm Wes The Dental Guy. And I'm John, the dental guy, and we are excited to be back with you and kind of getting back into the interview season, Wes. I mean, we, we're getting, and, and when we talk about interviews, I mean, you know, if you listen to a lot of podcasts, you, you know that many times the interviews are just sort of, you know, bringing people on, talk about their life story and, you know, what kind of flavor of ice cream they like. And, you know, on the dental guys, it's a little different. You know, we're looking for it's people quizzy. that really... Yeah, can you geek better, can geek out better, with us. You better geek out, right? I yeah, mean, you got to bring it. it. You got to bring it. And the and the guests we have on today, because I really just want to. I mean, I feel like we should just bring them right in, Wes. We have, I've known uh, Mark Ludlow for a long time, going back to the Death Star, University of Connecticut. He'll know what that means. And uh, it it's I've known him so long. Uh, it, it's funny now that we're definitely not getting old, but you know, you start to see these younger docs coming out of school. And like learning about some of the stuff that we're kind of talking about on the show. And then I have Mark like on the show and it's, it's, it's crazy to think that, but, uh, Mark was on a few months back and, uh, welcome. We're glad to have you back with us. Thanks guys. I'm pumped to be here. I mean, it's always fun to nerd out, talk about ice cream, you know, I mean, we could just, you know, jack around that forever. So, so yeah, I'm pumped to be here. So thank yeah, you guys very much for having me. Absolutely. Talk a little bit about what's going on in your world because there's some there's some big changes happening and some exciting stuff. Kind of give us a little update on what you've been up to and what you're going to be up to in the next uh, year or last year or so. Sure. Yeah. I mean, for the biggest thing is you could probably see below with this title. I've, I'm actually, you know, by the time this is out, I will have made a move to the University of Utah. So I've been with MUSC for going on seven years now. Um, and, you know, it was just time to make a move. Uh, you know, we've got family back in Utah. I'm originally from Salt Lake. You know, it got a great opportunity at the University of Utah. It's a really progressive school that really wants to kind of move very far forward in digital and implants. And it's going to be great, you know. And then from the personal side, you know, we've got my parents are there. My wife's parents are there as well. So, we, you know, our kids have never had grandparents before or any family mm. within about 25 miles so we're pretty pumped, you know, and kids are pumped about biking and snowboarding and skiing. And, you know, we could get Iron Horse, John, you know, from back in the day, <laughs> right. bring that out and do some sweet biking. <laughs> <laughs> yes, bringing it back. Do you know that Dowling yep. still has that bike? He has that <laughs> bike frame. Yes. Doesn't that sound right? Doesn't that sound right from all those years ago? We had, Dude, that's sounds- a long story, but... We had a friend that, you know, was kind of that guy. He would, you know, whatever you had, he would gladly take. And he still has it to this day. I think he finally got a new bike 
uh, once he once he got into this practice. But anyway, yeah, I'm excited for you to get yeah. to not only get out to a school which you love, you know, and and you kind of yeah. the history with and family and all of that. That's so huge. I feel like, but also they're doing like you say progressive approaches to what you are kind of been, what you've been doing a lot of, which is of course been the digital world. And, and tell us uh, about that. Are you going to be, you know, focused on mainly digital dentistry there? Is it going to be a little different, more expanded role, or is it still going to be that type of focus? Yeah. So I, they've got me coming in with three different, so I'm a section head of three different areas. So I'll be section head of digital dentistry, uh, implant dentistry, and removable prosthodontics. And I mean, the cool thing with all of those is, you know, it's a pretty fertile field. They've got some equipment, but you know, we're working with some of the people that I work with and we're going to bring in kind of a fair amount of stuff. And I mean, it's kind of neat. It's almost like a startup in the fact that they're like, look, we just kind of want, want you to bring your stuff, do some cool stuff. You're going to have time to think about it and develop things and work with companies and, you know, and really try to help, you know, our patient population and student population and resident population really, really grow and, and, and grasp all these new technologies and figure out how to use them. So, and one of the things we're really pumped on as weird as this sound is, you know, all the digital removable stuff of really mm. implementing that and trying to raise, raise the game that way, because I think there's a lot of things you can do with, with, you know, printers and milling machines and scanners that make you a little more mobile, if you will. And so can serve some patients that, you know, normally wouldn't be served. And those are the ones that, sometimes really need our help the most. And so we've got a lot of cool stuff that we're going to try to do with this, you know, relative to access of care and really heavily leveraging the technologies to help us with it. I know. So we're pumped. Time, I mean, we're excited. I know last time when we talked about it, you had a real passion for this digital dentistry and really helping dental students kind of get excited about what's possible. You were working in particular on implant flow and you were trying yeah. to make it to where every single implant just as possible, as much as possible could be placed uh, with a surgical guide. Is that something else that you're going to be working on there? Yep. Yeah. That's, that's a big part of it is, you know, coming in as, as kind of the head of the three of those areas. I mean, they all kind of overlap and, and that's one of the big things that, you know, when I've talked about with them out there is, you know, we'd really like to start moving in that direction where we're doing, you know, all digital planning, digital workups, all the different things mm -hmm. that we implemented here and really try to implement some of those things out there because I mean, the reality is it makes your implant treatment so much more predictable oh, yeah. uh, when you've got, you know, a really nice digital wax up, digital smile design, all these different things. And then all these parts and pieces just come together from the surgical and the process side. So it makes life way, 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 way easier. And so, yeah, that's something that we're going to implement. And I mean, that's something we've constantly been refining for the past whew, a lot of years. So yeah, so it sounds like you're it. able to come in there with sort of a, a way of doing things that's been vetted and, you know, you've kind of refined your processes there. So they, they get to uh, get you at a good time, you know, where you, you come in, yeah, bring in, bring in the heat, you know, and, and you can go right in and implement that. John, you know, the real yeah, reason that's, though. That's the hope. The, sorry, Mark, but the, you know the real reason Mark's on the show today, right? We've been talking about, <laughs> right, this this idea of when to make the next jump into the digital realm, right? I mean, we both have been scanning with an older type scanner. Still great, does great for what we're trying to achieve at this point right now. We've been waiting to have Mark on to really talk about what is going on in the scanner market right now? We just had Brad, the dental lab guy, on to talk about some of his frustrations. Um, and John, we're going to talk a little bit about that too, because I think Mark, being an educator, I'd like to hear what he has to say about what Brad said about yes. how scanners are being packaged and, and sold and then left into the dentist's hands to really learn how to use. Let's talk about that. But before we do that, we got to take a quick break for some word from our sponsor. So we're going to do that right now. And after the break, Mark's going to tell us what he's been doing lately in the scanner market. Hi, I'm Justin Goodbrand with Financially Simple. So perhaps you're considering buying your first practice or your second, third, or fourth. Here's a tip for you. Financing your new practice isn't as simple as just going out and getting a loan. It's important that you don't rate shop. 
You know, financing a dental practice involves many complex strategies that could make or break you financially. Will you carry multiple loans with different terms so that your payments are lower while you're first getting started and increase as your income increases? Or maybe you're just better getting a long fixed term. Or maybe you could get a loan that defers your first year's payments. Before making a decision that could put undue stress and financial burden on you, gain the wisdom of knowledgeable consultants. For more information about this and other dental related topics, visit financiallysimple.com forward slash dentist. This tip is for informational purposes only. Please speak with a competent financial advisor regarding your specific needs. Justin Goodbread is a registered investment advisor with Heritage Investors. Visit heritageinvestor.com, financiallysimple.com for additional information. All right, well, we are back with Mark Ludlow, and uh, we really want to dive into the meat of the show. And one of the things I think is going to help us, if you listen to the intro, you heard us talk about Brad, the dental lab guy, very well accomplished lab technician, knows a ton about digital, was on the show a few shows back. And we kind of asked him his opinion on scanners. And Mark, uh, just to kind of give you an idea of what he said, and I want to really, I think it's going to bring us right into talking about where we are now and what's getting better or what's still the same. And, you know, one of the comments that he made is he said, you know, when we're talking out now, let's qualify this. When you're talking about crown and bridge, basically your quadrant type of dentistry, that a lot of general dentists are kind of, that's their wheelhouse. They're very comfortable with that. Uh, you know, doing a single molar crown on number 19 with Emacs. Um, and his, from a lab standpoint, the concerns that he had was number one on margin marking and how easy it was to take the raw data and clean it up and then mark the margins. Uh, and, and then second of, second of all, maybe more of concern to him was what was happening in the marketplace with how these are being marketed to the dentist who has no experience or being kind of told, hey, this is great tool. Uh, and so you have somebody that may already be struggling heavily with retraction, for instance, and now you put a scanner in their hands, which is much more challenging potentially to be able to deal with retraction. And then there's sometimes, again, sometimes minimal training in some cases provided. And so it's all the, uh, the, yeah, all the okay, all the time. I'm glad, glad to hear you say that. So, and then what happens is, are we actually getting, Brad would claim, he's getting a worse product in some situations because at very least if he puts Impergum, for instance, now we're not, we're not selling Impergum, but puts Impergum in the hands of a typical dentist, it's got, it's so much more forgiving in certain ways. So talk a little bit about you know, both of those things. Like what, uh, let's address some of those concerns and then we'll talk about specific scanners. But let's maybe talk first about the marketing side because I think it's easy. It's kind of an easy topic to, you don't really have to know a ton about the technology. But uh, do you think the companies are doing a good enough job uh, at the maybe private practice level, let alone the dental school level of actually getting enough reps in people's hands of how they're supposed to use a scanner, are they making it sound like it's easier than it really is? Well, I'll be honest. I think that is kind of the perception of things out there is like when I go speak, because I, I, I speak to tons of people on these topics, you know, I mean, intraoral scanning all day long. And I have these people come up to me and they say exactly what you're saying. You know, they're like, I've been told you never have to use retraction cord and you don't have to do this, that, and the other. And I'm like, dude, like it's, it's a video camera. Like if you're not pulling, you know, you've got to have good quality retraction. You've got to have good quality heme control because if you don't have those things, your video beam can't see down there. And it's not like you're saying with like Imper gum, you know, or, or any of the materials they push and can push tissue out of the way. And you can get that significantly easier that way by just, you know, almost kind of closing your eyes up like this and squirting goo in there. And it's going to pretty much get you there. But the reality is, so, so yeah, I do hear that and, and see that as well. And, and I think when you really start talking to people, you, you do have to explain all the, these things are just tools. Let's be honest. All impression material is a tool, just like a scanner is a tool. And they all have rules and fundamental principles, which one needs to follow. And if you follow those principles and you do good dentistry, period, doesn't matter if you take an impression or do a scan, you're going to be fine. But where you get some of the problems is sometimes on that margin, 
where, you know, maybe they're not very good at taking the impressions and they're not very good at heme control and tissue retraction or this, that, and the other. And then you do get a scanner in someone's hands. And then sometimes that can be a little bit tough because you no longer can get the mechanical retraction and mechanical pushing of tissue away that you're used to. And so it can make marking the margins exquisitely difficult. I think where it does benefit a lot of people is if you're doing multiples, you know, we've all had those where we're doing multiple, you know, crowns. We pull an impression, we missed one. And we're like, suck. Now we got to go through and redo it all again. Whereas with the scanner, the nice thing is you just repack your cord and go ahead and get rid of that spot. Let your cord do its thing, you know, sit for five to 10 minutes and go re-image that spot and you're good to go. So I think there are some things that scanning can help us with. But the reality is you guys are completely right. And the lab guy was completely right is there needs to be a little bit better education as to how to do these things. Cause my personal journey. So I got my first scanner in 2006 and, you know, I thought I, I was a previous lab tech. So I was used to looking at impressions and, you know, I was pretty decent at, at, at taking impressions. And what I noticed, what the scanner actually did for me is it made me a better dentist because, you know, I'd see my prep and then it blow it up to like 20 X. And then I, you know, I'd look at it and be like, dang, what was this gerbil that's been eating my prep? I surely <laughs> didn't prep this. Like I'm much better than this, but you know, you blow it up that big and you see that that's where you got the problem. And so I've seen the both sides of what, you know, and, and from my lab colleagues, they've seen the both sides of what a scanner can do from the one side, it can make the conscientious, conscientious dentist even better because they're seeing their work and blowing it up and it's, they're wanting to get better at those things. But then we've also seen from the other side where, you know, people are just scanning and just thinking it's okay and kicking it off. And I think one of the biggest problems is, is someone's ability to actually, like we all can pull an impression, look at it. You can see the fins coming out and you know, you're good to go. But with the scanner, when you first get it and you're new at that, you're not used to looking at the screen. And so you may not know exactly what it's supposed to look like and what it, what it does. And so a lot of times when I'm training people, I have them turn off the color so you can just see the black and white. And all of a sudden it starts mm. really illuminating what, what they can see. And if they're struggling marking the margin, the lab's going to struggle equally, if not more. So I, I agree. It's an educational thing. And Unfortunately, sometimes when you buy these scanners, you don't get as much education as, as one would kind of hope. So who's so. responsible for educating, um, you know, after you buy a scanner? I mean, each, it seems like, you know, we discussed this on this show um, with Brad, that it seems like some of the, some of the best training is coming from some corporate entities. Some of it is, you know, where you might have even distributors that are in charge of the training and it's just kind of like a hodgepodge like of you know how how do you this is how you do it and you don't really know where to go i mean if you can buy a scanner right now i mean on facebook right and yep. it'll show up and you buy a laptop and you plug <clears> it in <throat> but do you go to some institute where what model of education is really, you know, working right now. Mm. That's, that's the hardest question because there, I don't, you know, there are some very good examples. Like I got to give a shout out to the C doc guys and the, you know, it's, it's old Sarek docs. Like I think those guys have done an absolutely excellent job of training people on how to do Sarek because they've got a multi-tiered approach where you start off with the basics and that's included in your scanner. And then basically from there, they've got level upon level upon level that, that, you know, someone that wants to learn can go through and go through all those levels and they attain the skills which they need. And it's a very nice model. Um, with some of the other scanners and some of the things, the hard part is instead of being part of one central entity, they are sold and everything's handled by the distributors. And depending upon your distributor, you may have a, a rep that comes out for half day, they may have a course that you go to for a day, or they may just have an online module that you get. And that's about the extent. And so that's one of the challenges. And so with those ones, you know, you're, you're kind of either at the mercy of learning from peer to peer from your friends and colleagues that have it, or there are some institutes and different things that you can go. 
you know, and learn more from, from their gurus. But, you know, there really isn't a good centralized model for teaching these things. And I get asked all the time, especially with implant planning stuff, you know, and digital implant stuff, they're like, where can I go to learn these things? And unfortunately, you don't have a good repository for it right at the mm. moment. Yeah, it seems and like I think implementation that's, is the problem, yeah, right? Yeah, that's right. And it, it seems like there's not a good standardized curriculum either. And that's what I know that, uh, you know, and again, not, we don't we're not plug in these, but we, you know, we've been out at Spear Education and of course, Seric Doctors, you know, they've kind of done some partnership stuff over the year with Spear, over the years with Spear. And is they, they've tried to put together Samir, Puri and those guys, you know, to, to yeah. do some stuff that is legit, um, that is uh, systematic um, for, and not just for Sarek, but I think for kind of applying to multiple scanners. Uh, but it is very difficult because of every scanner being so different, software being so different, uh, and even the way the lab handles it being so different. Um, and the amount of training you really would need, I mean, I get the feeling it's kind of almost just a, you know, throw it out there and eventually it, it gets figured out. And many times I think it's the lab and that's what Brad from the lab was talking about is that, you know, many times it falls on the lab to be the trainer. And of course they know a lot, but, um, with technology changing quickly too, that, you know, they're still not in the end, the dentist and they're not the company right. and they're not getting paid oftentimes other than just the business that they're getting. So it's a really Correct. interesting place that we're in, I think with this technology, because obviously it's a huge amount of money that these people are investing yeah. in buying it. Um, well, that's interesting. It sounds like to me, like it's, it's really, it's going to take years maybe to solve this, starting with, you know, first off, what you, you guys are doing at the educational level of dental school and prosthodontics level of having new grads maybe that are going to come out knowing how to use these systems, at least knowing the basics. And yep. probably that will trickle up <laughs> rather than trickle down, you know, hopefully to maybe the doc they come in work with as an associate or something and they can show them. And it's a weird model. It's almost a reverse mentorship model. Uh, yeah, that's, happened that's to me. exactly what it is, this reverse mentorship. You know, I mean, and we see it in, in the institutions as well as some of the residents, some of the students know how to use this stuff a lot better than their, than their senior faculty. And they're the ones that are actually teaching some of the senior faculty. And it's the same deal. You know, people get out, they go into associateships, they go into a group, you know, that may have a, a system that was bought that hasn't been really used and they can go ahead and pick that up and start using it. And, you know, cause it's just like anything, you know, there's clinical nuances with any system you buy and like some of it, yes, you do have to just pick up and learn and you'll learn those nuances. But, you know, again, guys like Sam and CDOT guys, like they do have a systematized training program, which works pretty well. And I wish a lot of the other companies had something similar because, you know, they can get a pretty consistent product out you know, the product being the actual, you know, dentist or clinician that I think having something formalized like that can do, whereas you don't see that with some of the other scanners or different things like that. In the poor labs, like it's actually on both sides because, you know, sometimes if someone buys a scanner, the lab's got to help them, but it actually goes the other way a lot. Sometimes it's like the dentist wants to buy a scanner. They get the scanner and then they send it to their lab guy who doesn't do any digital stuff and has never gotten any scans before. And then that guy's in kind of world of hurt because he's got to then go through and figure out how to do stuff from his end. And that also is where something breaks down. If he's used to just hand stacking porcelain and now all of a sudden he's printing out a model with the dye and then building on that and all of a sudden figuring, well, dang it, it's not really fitting as well as I wanted because there were some errors built up through there, you know? Yeah. Mm. So, mm. so yeah, we'll it's, it's, a hard, the... it's a hard thing to have. Let's open up another box Let's open up another door into the Geek's Corner, right? <laughs> and so this right. Geek's Corner is where we want to live for just a little while tonight. And if you're listening to this, I think this is a great show to share around about people that really want to know what's possible right now mm -hmm. in predictable and consistent, right? It's not so much about like what works in my hands or your hands. It's about what we can do to change dentistry on a global level. Like, right, that's repeatable dentistry, right? Everybody knows, yep. 
you know, how impression material works, right? Yeah, there's different brands and things like that, but globally we know that we need to use tissue retraction. We need to flow it in some manner with some light body. You know, we can apply that to global education. So what are we doing right now as far as scanning that is actually global? Well, we know that scanning's been around for a long time. We know single unit crowns. We know that quadrant dentistry works, you know, three unit crown and bridge even works. And then we can even go as far to say that um, single unit implant dentistry, we feel like that at least in the posterior um, is very predictable at this point with scan bodies and uh, scanning analogs. And, and then we also feel like that there are some full arch applications right now that are very predictable. That's night guards, that's sleep appliances, that's even, you know, printing models and making retainers and there's all kinds of things that we can print off of these things that don't need to be have the accuracy as some of the highest level accurate, you know, implant models with cross arch stability and cross arch trueness and all those things. So the question is right now to Mark, um, what what's exciting? We asked you this last time, right? And you were working on some pretty amazing workflows beyond what I just talked about that yeah. were beginning to kind of come to light. Talk about what you're getting. I mean, this is a dental guy's exclusive thing right. we're hearing yeah. about right yeah, now. Yeah, like, are we there yet? Are we are there we yet? there? Yeah, so we're there. <laughs> Within the next, probably by the time this gets released, w the workflows will be released. So we've gotten to the point with full arch implant stuff, working with Prime Scan, working with Dent Supply Serona with their new scan bodies, the new 5.2 software that's that's now released as well, where a lot of different things from, you know, from algorithms to laboratory workflows to, you know, the ability to kind of modularly build things in 3Shape and ExoCAD, you know, we're to the point where, you know, just last week, you know, I scanned upper and lower arch on a patient, you know, it was a double arch hybrid case scan that one. the same day I delivered a digital denture on the top in a lower arch. Um, and again, that's kind of important that it's a lower arch, full arch, you know, implant case with a milled bar with modularly built gums and teeth all on top of that with no model, no verification, no anything just straight from the intraoral scans with core files built of the bar that we can put in, you know, in our, our laboratory software. And I mean, we're there. That's, what's really cool about it. I mean, we're in a very interesting time right now and it's only going to get better and better and better. Hmm. What's made that possible. What's made that change possible in the last say year. Is it just that the data has now been published that, validates it was it there from the beginning or is it new hardware new software new scan bodies you can talk about what's changed yeah so the biggest things which have changed is you know the interesting thing about scanners is every time the hardware upgrade or a new comes out obviously ends to be better okay so that's the first thing but that gets you better in a global perspective then with each software update things get better and better and better. We actually have a paper coming out where we're looking at the what software updates do and almost ubiquitously, ubiquitously across the board, you know, accuracy gets better, fidelity gets better, you know, trueness, all those different things get better. So the scanners from a software perspective have gotten much, much, much better. One of the interesting things on 5.2, which we've been testing, and this, this is with the prime scan, is what we see is, you know, on most scanners, they have this thing called extrapolation. So like, if your hands are like this, you know, roughly where the two would come together, right? Like if we're missing data between the two, like what scanners generally do is they'll fill that in to what they think according to the algorithms is that should be. And that is great. But when we're talking about the most high fidelity and high trueness that we can get is by having missing data and filling in that data, it can then begin to warp the scan body a little bit. And if it warps the scan body a little bit, when you go to then align it in the laboratory software, that can be that little bit of warpage can then change how it fits 
And then, you know, you do that across an arch and all of a sudden you can get some with fit because it will, you know, all those little airs will accumulate. Well, part of what 5.2 can do from the implant side is it almost shoots it, if you will, in raw. It won't extrapolate mm. that data. Mm. And so if you get the cylinder of the scan body, and these new scan bodies are different as well, they're more just a straight cylinder. If you get the cylinder, it's not going to extrapolate any of that data. So you're getting the true, true data of that cylinder. And so thus it's going to merge better and we're thus being able to get the the accuracy down the line that we need to build these things. So it was very interesting. The one I just delivered, you know, we had an, there were two little holes and I wish I could like flip this and show you guys the, the data, but there were two little holes in two of the scan bodies and it was four implants for the bottom, but we still had a 97% merge accuracy. Like they came in absolutely mm. perfect when they merged together. And, you know, again, this was a lower arch, a real pretty tough case and everything just went, right down completely passive. You know, I was able to kind of retract things down and take pictures to where, you know, we can see zoomed in that everything's the bars right down perfectly on the multi units. And then, you know, we had modular printed gums made from a carbon printer. Then we could have either done carded teeth or milled or printed teeth over the top. And then everything comes together and, and goes forward. So, I mean, it's the, mm. the accuracy of the scanners are getting so much better and then what's really made the change is now all the workflows from the laboratory side are becoming more predictable as well, mm. because that's always been kind of our hangups is we've been able to do it, but it's, you know, we jimmied it from this software and kind of tricked the software to do this. And then we were able to do it. But now all the workflows are validated from one software to another software to another software. And that's been the biggest change. So it's a really exciting time. You know, I, like I'm just pumped because it's finally here and I don't have to freaking Jimmy rig things anymore. Yeah. So. Wow. Wow. That's exciting. Yeah, I mean, to, uh, to hear that. Shocking, that boom. Right? So it's like, yeah, yeah. So yeah I, I know. Like hit mute so, here or so something. So the biggest you know, thing, but, yeah. so it was always, it was always verification jig, right? That was always the step that we were being told no matter what kind of couldn't be, couldn't be skipped. Um, well, and it, then the next. Why? That, that always cracks me up. What What's the point of a verification jig? Mm. It's to verify that your impression, the model you made from your impression material, that the inaccuracies from your impression material and shrinkages and expansions and whatnot of stone match. Well, we're not doing any of that anymore. Mm. Like it's going from one aspect and staying completely digital into another and we're not having to, you know, print something just so we can feel good about ourselves and do a verification. Yeah. It makes sense. Yes, it makes sense. Verification it... like 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> really? I love it. Well, so what you're saying, Mark, is that really you could stay digital up to the last minute. And then once you have to go analog, whether it be for a prototype to check out function and aesthetics or and once you've done that and you say, yeah, I'm good here you know, scan that back in if you made modifications to aesthetics or function or whatever changes, and then basically fabricate whatever you want at this point. You know, yep. you don't really even need a model per se. Uh, nope. You know. So what? Do you, so talk to us a little bit about in this workflow, um, and I, I realize you, you heavily qualified the fact it was a lower, right? Because there's, yep. there's, there's a few differences, so how are you dealing with the oh, prototype yeah. side and, and how are you dealing with, I know we've seen labs develop, you know, kind of like rapid prototyping with, you know, printed, uh, printed wax rims, if you will, and different sizes and shapes. You know, how are you, how are you dealing with the, the size, assuming you wanted to do this on a maxillary arch with the fewest number of appointments, you know, I, I, maybe that's not all the way validated yet, but, but talk a little bit about that step and how you translate you know, a tooth design or using face scanning, you know, how, what are you doing to, to make that all the virtual patient as best you can? Yeah. Well, I think the biggest thing with this is like, is what the patient starts off with, for example, like if the mm. patient comes in and you've got a conversion prosthesis that you're stoked on, you like the teeth are in the right spot with just, you know, even if they're not in the right spot at that point, I like calling that like a digital wax rim. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm. Because that's in essence what it is. You can snap some photos and just 
go through your normal aesthetic workup so you would say and say okay from where this incisal edge is here we're going to need a drop at two millimeters we're going to need to move it at one millimeter to the left because we kind of missed the midline in the conversion or whatever so we use that as that digital wax rim so what you can mm -hmm. do is go ahead and scan the kind of workflow is you would scan first off i like scanning the opposing arch okay so let's Let's say we're doing that upper like you're mentioning so you take the lower arch and the first thing i do is have them go tap 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 with paper and then go ahead and scan that with the marks on there okay like madam butterfly because or something like that like accufilm 2 or i use whatever my assistant hands me just make sure i've got vaseline on it so i can get a very good you know mark there yeah. you know and yeah. if you're doing a cr bite you can do it with a you know a leaf gauge a lucia jig whatever you need to do manipulate them in doesn't matter what you do you know whatever your flavor is that's the thing these mm -hmm. are just general principles applied in the digital way but i like going ahead and scanning it with the marks on the opposing because when you get into the articulating steps later on you can make sure that your heat map comes together and you're hitting the exact same dots does that make yeah. sense Yep, totally. Yep. Because because if you do that, you've already got the bite verified before the patient actually walks out the door. Because if not, you know, either articulating it or they're not sure, you're just kicking it off. Well, you can check it before the patient leaves. And if it's off, if those bite marks are way different than what you got when you scanned the articulation together, well, you've got a problem there. So anyway, that's mm. the first thing I do on the opposing arch is always just go tap, tap, tap. So we get the marks there. Then you go ahead and scan the upper conversion prosthesis, okay? Noting any changes you'd want to make to that. Then you take that thing off. You go ahead and scan the tissue with the heads of the multi-units there. And once that's done, then you just put the scan bodies on and scan that, okay? And then from there, everything kind of comes together. And the beauty is everything is then cross arch mounted at that same vertical mm. and same bite that you took at the very beginning. Gotcha. Okay. And so at that point, then it will go to the lab and you've got a couple different workflows that you can do. You can go, you know, a full art zirconia on, you know, the temporary type cylinders that we use for those things. You can do a bar and go zirconia over that. You can do a bar and go metal acrylic. It really doesn't matter which way you go, but all those things, you then would design the teeth, you know, or get the core file for the bar, or whatever it is you do. But you design the teeth and you use that your own conversion prosthesis as your digital wax rim and say okay let's design the teeth we're going to move it this way we're going to do this we're going to do this etc and then you know at that point either print out a try-in if you're doing a bar you could just basically get the bar print the try-in out monolithic try-in and just take it to the mouth screw the bar in do the verification of that you know make sure that that thing fits passively then you just slide the teeth right over the bar and then have them bite, check all the aesthetics, do all those things. And you've got your trying right there. If you're doing monolithic zirconia, for example, you do the exact same thing, but you would have your trying printed or milled with the titanium cylinders glued in there and just have the patient come in, screw those in, try it. Any changes you'd make, go ahead and make those adjustments or just say relative to this, these are the changes that I want make to be made and then you just go back into the software and make the changes. So, so yeah, that's mm. kind of how it goes. So that's how you do your try. And so that'd be your second visit. Then your third visit would be your final. I mean, the one I just delivered last week, um, I liked my conversion prosthesis mm -hmm. and with the upper denture, I didn't love the upper denture, but I knew the things I would want to change. And so I didn't even bother with the try -in. Cause I'm like, mm. what's the point of a try? And I know where I'm going with these things. So just make me go to final. We just went to final and it was one visit, you know, it was just mm. the impression visit and then the final visit. So, so, uh, yeah. so I who think we get is... stuck in, in, these, in these protocols that we've done forever. And sometimes we got to think about why exactly we're doing them or how to actually speed some of these things up. Mm. So who, so which, which, um, when you say validated, um, what is, what systems are currently validated for this type of workflow? So the one, again, I've been working with all the time. And again, this is from the implant manufacturer itself is all the dense Plicerona implant lines, you know, that's Astrotech, Zive and Ankylos. 
um, with their multi units and with the prime scan. So that's uh, sorry, I got a couple texts in there, so that's good. But uh, that's uh, the basic. Jeez, this is my buddy Wally. I don't know if you guys know Wally or Renee, but yes, uh, yeah. So, but these are you know with their three implant lines with the prime scan, you know with these new scan bodies, it's all validated with that. Um, I work with Ankylos or with uh, Elos as well, who makes a lot of people scan bodies, and we're doing kind of a similar thing with them on on some different workflows and different things as well. But you know, right now this is the first one that we know of, you know, from an implant manufacturing side, um, that's completely validated soup to nuts. Everything's together, and I mean, it's it's a pretty darn cool thing that we've got mm-hmm. it to this point. So what would it take for a manufacturer? I mean, obviously prime scan scans other implant uh, manufacturers. What does it take to develop the systems? Like say you're placing a different implant, you know, maybe you're placing a Strawman or BioHorizons or something else, right? What does it take to, you know, move to this type of workflow if you're not using those implants? Is that going to be like open source? I mean, that's just where the... The rubber meets the road. I, I hope so. I mean, that that's the honest thing is, you know, I hope that, I mean, I'm, I'm a digital nerd, you know, and I, I use a lot of different <laughs> stuff. I get a lot of different things sent to me, you know, from implant cases and whatnot. And yeah, that's what I really hope is that these get validated for these other systems so that it can be ubiquitous. And I think <laughs> that's where it ends up going. But, you know, at first, because it, it, it takes a lot of resources and a lot of R and D to go through and, and validate all this stuff. And, you know, making umpteen numbers of bars off of these fake models and fake maxillas and fake mandibles, you know, by multiple clinicians all around the world with different, you know, parameters and stuff to be able to say, okay, we've done 80 gajillion of these and our air is X amount. And this is within the realm of possibility, et cetera. Um, so that's, it, it, it's a lot of work and I know mm-hmm. all the companies are kind of booking to do this right now. Um, it's just, I think as far as one from an implant manufacturer, I think this one's going to be the first one out there, but yeah, I hope it comes out and, and this is just the beginning into where it starts spreading to all the other systems as well. Well, talking about systems, let's kind of change subjects here and, and kind of finish the show on this topic of, um, you know, we talked a lot about this last time we had you on, which was who's doing it right, uh, what's new, um, what should we be looking at t- to purchase, and obviously we're yeah. getting excited hearing you talk about what Serona is doing, against why Serona is doing with uh, validating these workflows. They're obviously pushing forward, um, and so I think if you are looking at Full Arc, it's certainly a system you're going to be looking at. Um, what? what would you say, you know, we've got some, some players that have come on maybe strong in the marketing world in the last couple of years. One of them has been almost a kind of a little bit of a grassroots marketing effort with Medit, uh, who had the I 500 that really pushed that hard. And then, you know, immediately yeah. released the 700 kind of right after that. Talk about them, talk about what's going on in, in, uh, the world, the other worlds that we've kind of spoken the most about, uh, in the, in, in, in what would you, do you tell a clinician that's looking for maybe quadrant dentistry, at least as a starting sure. point, uh, that systems that would work well for that? Uh, and then maybe somebody who's looking to uh, do more full arch uh, with uh, with some of these newer workflows. You know, what are this? Who's doing it right? What should they be looking at? Yeah. So, I mean, again, I'll, I'll, I'll talk. The reality is, I'll be honest, scanners are getting pretty good. You know, I mean, mm. there's rarely you know, this big, like a couple of years ago, you know, you'd have these really true scanners, if you will, that got you really good results. And there'd be some of these others that were way, way, way down the road. And again, it's not that much anymore, especially when you're talking about quadrant dentistry. Okay. I mean, most things are going to scan that quadrant. Great. You know, Mm -hmm. what you need to do at that point is look at the workflows of what you're trying to do. You know, someone's looking at a scanner. The very first thing I ask them is, you know, do you just want something that's scan only or do you want to be able to design and mill something in your office? Mm. Because those are two two very different things. Um, you can do both the scan only and design in your office, but if you just want to actually design, that does limit you a little bit on some of the, the scanners out there. So that's the first thing. And then the second thing is I ask, 
really, what do you do? Because myself as a prosthodontist and, you know, most of my practice is full arch. My needs are very different than someone that's doing quadrant dentistry, for example, you know, yep. bread and butter dentistry, or even, you know, the surgeon that's, that's scanning just for arches for, you know, a single for their referral or arches for a surgical guide. Those are completely different things. So you've got to be very honest about figuring out what you want to use these things for. You know, mm -hmm. just talking about some of the individual scanners, and I can talk about all of them if you want. I mean, that may be helpful to the listeners. Like my go-to when I need absolute accuracy is I pick up the prime scan. That's for all my big, big, big implant stuff. That's what I use just because we've, we've found that to be the most accurate thing for these things. And so that's when I pick up every single time for those. Uh, my other workhorse that I use is I have a Trios 4. And I think the Trios 4, it's a lovely scanner. It does a wonderful job. It does pretty much everything very well. It is a great scanner. And I think those are kind of the, two of the most premium level scanners. And, and you pay for those premium level scanners. You know, when we get to talking about kind of that next tier down, and those are probably the two that have the best accuracy of everything that we've we've done so far now from there you know if we drop kind of you know and i wouldn't even say it's a next tier if we just drop down a little bit just a little bit in the accuracy perspective you know we run into these other scanners like you know the medit the emerald s um those are kind of my next two that we use most frequently after them you know we've got an i700 i'll be honest that's a pretty darn good machine like it scans very well um it's easy to use the tip i'll be honest that's one of the funky things is the tip's a little bit smaller than the other ones but it's been a good little scanner so far you know and it's same deal with the emerald s you know it's got the slimline tip and the normal tip on there and i think those things do great jobs for you know nearly everything that one would need so yeah. I, I honestly don't think you can go wrong with a scanner these days. And, you know, I'll be honest, we don't have, you know, we've got the company data relative to the, to the I 700, but as of actually, this will be on Thursday. We're doing a big, we, we do a big, huge scanning study about once a year. And these things are just brutal because we try to make the situation as close to the mouth as we can. So we get cadavers, we scan them with, um, with uh you know high powered laboratory scanners you know it costs us like three or four grand just to scan these these cadavers you know once or twice with these things but then we go through with all the different scanners have to scan the specimen eight times because that's our kind of power number that we've we've figured out then we take conventional impressions with these things and you know it ends up taking us like 14 or 16 hours to do these studies but then when we go through and start looking at the data, we're really able to see how accurate these things work in the mouth. When there's teeth, when there's dentin, when there's enamel, there's palate, there's, you know, gum tissue, there's everything. And it's the best thing which we've been able to do to figure out, you know, how accurate these puppies are. And that's coming up on, on Thursday. So we should have some data here on the I met I-700, but... You know, I'll be honest, it's, I've scanned with it. My residents have scanned with it. We just started, you know, our new crop of residents. And one of them was like, dude, I like that one the best because it was just very easy for her to scan with and, and quite simple. So, mm -hmm. I mean, I th think we time where there's wonderful, wonderful scanners out right now. And, you know, you really can't go wrong. You know, again, if what I do, like I say, scanning is full arch hybrids day in, day out. That's a little bit different than most people are doing. So, I mean, yeah. You know, and for me, I, I need that absolute top of the line, highest absolute accuracy that we can get just because that's what I need to get those restorations passive. But I'm weird, man. Like most people aren't like me. and Most people don't need to do those things. And I think all these scanners do a pretty darn good job at taking a great impression, you know? Mm. The thing that I think that listeners like to hear is – what should I buy? What should I buy? But the hard oh, yeah. thing that you're hearing right now is that, you know, you have to decide what type of dentist you are first and yeah. kind of, you know, the, the greatest thing that he's done here for us as listeners is 
basically you need to qualify yourself, right? Qualify yourself for what type of dentistry you're doing. And you know what the greatest news is today is that we have choices. It mm-hmm. used to yeah. be, I remember back in dental school, there was one thing and it was Seric yep. 2D, you know, and it was yep. crazy, right? I mean, like unbelievable that we could even do anything with this thing. Designing yeah. 3D objects in two dimensions in CAD, you know, and here we are, you know, 30 years later, right? 20 some years later, and we're talking about being able to do full arch restorations with the trueness and accuracy that probably rivals the best impression material and, and yep. maybe even, maybe even take some of the errors out that we run into with impression materials. I would say that it does, but yep. um, what I, what I like about this again is the choices. And um, I think that if you're listening to this, I think that's important because there's a lot of marketing right now. I just think about the marketing that's surrounding some of the things I even saw today, just kind of in show prep, just looking at the scanners, like the thing that always pops up is we can scan in 30 seconds of full arch, right? I mean, Mark, does that really matter? Nope. I mean, if, if, if you really need, you know, if you're concerned between 30 seconds for a full arch and a minute for a full arch, you run a much more productive practice than anyone I know ever (laughs) because the reality is like it, it really doesn't matter that much. Yes. The quicker you scan, you know, the better for your patient, the better for you because that's a better experience for them. But the reality is all these things are going to do a pretty good job. Tip size really does make a difference on that. So like a scanner with the bigger tips can allow you to scan a little bit quicker but then that bigger tip's going to run you into some troubles when you need to get back to a second or a third molar or up a retromolar pad or back, you know, in a hamular notch area. So, so everything that there is, is there's just a little bit of a trade-off with it. And, you know, I mean, it, it's, it's all just fundamental dentistry. You know, you do a good job with all the things that we've talked about and you, you mm-hmm. in your conscientious scanner and, and trying to make the best mm-hmm. for it you're going to do a good job and your patients are going to get good result. And you know, that will help build your practice. But I think what, some of the, some of the marketing on these things is it's a little interesting sometimes. It's interesting, right? One of the things that Brad brought up and it's being marketed pretty heavily. And one of his top choices right now for scanners, honestly, was the iTero, right? And, you know, of course he is doing mostly with his doctors quadrant dentistry. Right, Mark. What's your yeah. opinion about the Itero? They have several different levels, obviously, of the uh, of their scanners, and Align Technologies has made quite a bit of an investment in this Itero brand. Yeah, I think you know from the Itero perspective, I'll be honest, it's an accurate scanner. It does a good job uh, from a usability perspective. I think it's you know from a time perspective, it is a little bit slower than all the other scanners. Um, especially when you look at having to do full arch implant work, you know, in our last study, and again, we didn't publish any of the time perspectives, but it was about three to four times slower than every other scanner out there. It got us a good result when we finished, but it took (laughs) us a lot longer. And I'd say the biggest take home, which any of the listeners can get out of this is, you know, don't listen to any of the marketing hype. You know, call if you're a Shine fan, a Patterson fan, whatever you, whoever your distributor is, call them up and say, hey, bring in all of your scanners. Let me sit down. Let me scan my assistants. Let my assistant scan me. Just get a feel for it in the mouth because that's going to be, that's going to tell you more than anything else, period, is you just getting your hands on the thing, feeling it, seeing how it tracks, seeing how easy it is for you know, to set up a case and get, you know, and elicit your staff and say, you know, which one do you guys like? What you feel the best? Because the reality is they're going to be scanning most of your stuff for you anyway. John, so, but I'd say question. really just try these things out and go from yep. there because once you try it out, <laughs> that's huge. I got one final question and then we're going to close the show. Mark, I really appreciate your time tonight. It's been great. Oh, it's been awesome. It's me jazzed up to hear you next time speak on podium. 
yeah. and uh, talk about some of these validated workflows. But, you know, John and I are kind of holding fast, right, for the quote unquote graphics card upgrade every year, right? I mean, like everybody wants to upgrade their computer yeah. graphics card and all these things. You always want to upgrade your phone, like the next iPhone is set to come out, the next Android phone. I mean, what are we upgrading, right? Well, should we upgrade our scanner, John? Right? That's our question, right? What, you know, what should we be doing? Both John and I do quite a bit of full arch dentistry. We do quite a bit of quadrant-based dentistry. I mean, we are in general dentistry, but we are practicing, you know, in a comprehensive environment. So we use yeah. currently the TrueDef scanner, right? We're back in the day, right? With 3M, now Midmark's TrueDef, right? Powder. <laughs> We still use it. It's right? time. It's it's time. <laughs> it, it's time. It's time to upgrade the graphics. It's card, time. Right? So tell us, yep. um, you know, what should we buy? See, I hate that question, man. I, I get that all the time. <laughs> I know. We know you did. That's why we had to ask. It's so hard to answer that. Again, I just refer you to what we talked about at the beginning. See what you really want what you want to try, what you're really doing 99% of the times. Like we started off talking a little bit about bikes. Like this is the problem with bikes. Like you buy this like <laughs> bike that you think is going to be the best thing. Like for that 5% of the time you ride like these crazy gnarly trails, mm -hmm. like you buy this big over bulk bike for that. And I think with scanning, with any equipment purchase, we've really got to take, you know, stock into what we're really doing and what we want to try to achieve with it you know with the true def you're doing a scan only type of you know procedure right now like you're not designing you're not milling you're not doing any of those things so you've got quite a few options that you can go with and then from there you know i'll be honest i would get get your distributor in bring them in and try them all out you know, I think Trios makes a good model. I love my Prime Scan. Again, that's used all the time. I love the Trios, but these other ones are great as well. You know, and they come in at a little lesser price point. And so you've just got to figure out what's best for you in your practice and in the overhead that you're that you have and make some decisions like that. So I'm not going to answer that question for you. I think it's a great yeah, answer. Because it's a great answer. It's very yeah, it's hard. perfectly good answer. It's a great answer, John. Yeah. So, so you've heard it here. The dental guys might be in the market for scanning technology in the near future. Um, and we're excited. Dude, why don't you guys just it. come up and visit me before I bell and you guys can See, try them all out over John the next two weeks. John and I talked weeks. about this, Mark. John and I talked about this. Two we, weeks. We, we got two weeks. We got two weeks. Got two weeks. <laughs> but we can go to Utah, John, because there's a lot to do in Utah. There's a lot of hiking, mountain biking, all the things that you and I love. We like to do all those things. Yeah. We just need to go to the University of Utah and see mark yeah maybe we can do a live show there that'd be cool but hey listen that'd be awesome i really appreciate mark being on the show and we really appreciate the information you've shared mark thanks so much for uh, joining us and we'll look forward to having you back on i'm excited about uh, what you have coming up uh, just in parting words tell us a little bit where you're going to be speaking <clears> next <throat> and um and as we close the show yeah um i think probably Man, I haven't even looked at my schedule. I just literally go like week to week to week. I, I'm going to be at Amos. The Amos meeting's coming up, uh, DS World. I've got a couple lectures there at DS World. Again, the Amos meeting at the ACP meeting this year, I've got a, got a lecture there as well. Um, those are kind of some of the big ones that we've got got coming up. And we have actually, it's pretty cool. We've got some of the international ones starting to roll again. So we'll see if, I'm supposed to be in Germany in December, but we'll see if, you know, with COVID, whether that, that opens back up and different things like that. But, you know, we just had a big CE event, uh, this past weekend and I'll be honest, man, it was so great to be, you know, I've done a number so far back live, but man, it's so nice just to be, you know, get everybody back together. Mm -hmm. You know, there's nothing, I think it's one of those things that we all kind of miss, you know? And so it's just so nice to be back together and, you know, an AO next year, I'll be at, be at AO as well. So, I mean, got a lot of a lot of stuff coming up a lot of good things coming up and you know i just awesome. feel very privileged you know to have some of these opportunities so it's a good blessing well if you see mark on stage make sure you uh, uh say hi and uh, go up to him and encourage him 
um, and so much um, was given on this podcast that you might need to share with someone. And the way we like people to do that is, first of all, have you give us that five-star review on Apple Podcast. Make sure you're giving us all the stars you can. Give us all the love. We just got a response from a listener this week, and uh, just just some good feedback. I really appreciate that. I know John and I are encouraged every time we hear somebody say, hey, we like what we hear. Keep doing what you're doing. And so you could find us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, all those things. Reach out to us. Send us a direct message. And so uh, really, again, I appreciate Mark coming on the show. So for Mark, for John, I'm Wes, and this has been The Dental Guys.